Hi, I'm Kylie Baker and this talk is to share with you some tips about procedural guidance. Essentially it's things to avoid. Let's state right from the beginning that it's forgivable to make a mistake but please don't make it twice. It's even better if you can learn from other people's mistakes rather than try them all out yourself and so for this reason I've put up as many mistakes as I could collect in the hope that you will learn from them. The most important take-home message from this talk is that three minutes of planning beats three months of worry. But I think we should expand on this. I think that in emergency medicine, intensive care, anaesthetics, we should not just be good at procedural guidance, we should be absolutely fifth dan. We should be able to look at any procedure, at anything on the screen and choose one of three or four methods to approach it. We should be able to choose the best approach for the particular patient. The second thing I'd like to say about this talk is that it works best if you have an ultrasound machine beside you, a cannulation phantom of some sort and a needle so that every time you see something you can stop and have a practice just to see what it feels like and what it looks like on a screen to make this particular mistake. We're going to start with the most simple of mistakes and work our way through to the fairly complex mistakes by the end of this talk. It's important we start at the beginning. Not that we can't do this, but when we're teaching someone for the first time we need to remember what it was like to be a beginner. One thing my dad always used to say was uh, when you have to learn to teach beginners you should go back and try it with your, your non-dominant hand because that brings back to you just what it's like. Now in this particular problem here we can see that the uh, vessel isn't perfectly aligned with the middle of the screen and the needle is not directly above the vessel. What is it that causes or what are the many things that can cause this to happen? The first issue I like to call continental drift. It's usually more obvious to someone watching over the shoulder than to the actual person performing the procedure. It tends to happen at the beginning when the person doing the cannulation takes their eyes off the screen, perhaps to get hold of a cannula or to prep the skin. And when they're not paying attention, the probe just tends to follow its natural tendency and slide down lubricated slopes. What we see is the vessel moving just slowly off the midline and even a few millimeters off the direct midline is going to impair your target accuracy. Continental drift is also associated with the no touch technique. Folk who don't really want to get their hands messy with all that yucky gel. This is one of the many reasons we insist that you uh, brace yourself on the patient on the bed on a chair because it does two things. It means that if your hand does start to slide you can feel it and secondly it means that you're not actually using the probe itself as a brace meaning that you'll be putting less pressure on the vessel and you're less likely to compress it. And have you ever had that experience whereas you gradually edge your needle down towards the vessel, the vessel seems to be quietly sidestepping away from your needle. This usually means that you haven't scouted the territory properly before you put needle to skin. A common area for this is the antecubital fossa where that median cubital vein may run quite oblique to the long axis of the limb. This is one of the reasons that I like to turn 90 degrees and image the vessel in long wherever I can because that gives me the orientation of the probe showing me the exact orientation of the vessel before I put the needle in. Most of us who teach ultrasound guided cannulation harp on the necessity to line everything up ahead of time to place the screen where it is in your direct line of sight looking along your needle straight at the probe. But even when you line all these things up it's still possible not to hit the target. And this happens when your needle is not necessarily perfectly 90 degrees to the probe cover. 
So in summary, if you want to avoid these malalignment errors, prepare things ahead of schedule. Scout, line yourself up carefully and be pedantic about having the vessel in the centre of your screen, your needle approaching the centre of your probe face and the needle perpendicular to the probe. And finally, let's steal yet another phrase from the airline industry, and that's brace, brace, brace. Uh, now, perhaps if you're at the top of your game at the beginning of your shift, you can manage to thread a needle standing on one leg. But honestly, uh, by the end of the shift, it's best to do the best you can for the patient. I like to make sure that my hyperthene eminence is braced on the patient so I can feel if there's any continental drift happening that my forearm is braced on the bed and that my backside is firmly planted in a chair or a stool. Because honestly at the end of a 10 hour shift I'm pretty wobbly. Now if you think that you really can cannulate without this sort of bracing please give it a try. But give it a try with your non-dominant hand and let's see just how good you are. Trap number two happens when you lose contact with the tip of the needle. Maybe you had to glance away briefly uh, away from the screen or, or perhaps you've been using that in-out jiggle and so what happens is you start pushing in and out even more to try and find it again. So here we see the flare of the bevel and then it disappears so you poke around a bit more push in a bit further then maybe in desperation fan the probe and lo and behold you've hit the bed. So why does this happen? Take note of how the bevel is much brighter than the shaft, particularly when you have such a steep angle of incidence. So ways to avoid this problem are to stop that in-out jiggle. We'd also recommend that you don't fan the probe because you can lose your orientation with the vessel and the needle this way. We recommend to our beginners that you navigate by the bevel only. As soon as that bevel flashes in the screen, you stop advancing the needle and you push the probe a little bit further away. As soon as you push the probe off that bright flare of the needle, you push the needle tip back into the beam width. Then you stop the needle and you advance the probe. In this sort of leapfrog method, we slowly make our way down to the vessel. This gives you time to correct if you find yourself moving off-center just briefly. The other thing you can do, of course, is buy a very expensive needle. If you haven't quite got the money for this, you can suck a little bit of air into the trocar, but of course this will put a little bit of air when you finally inject. The last thing, not on this slide, is that you can enter with a more shallow angle of entry. See what a difference the shallow angle of entry makes to the echogenicity of the needle shaft. Important to remember that angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, so that your ultrasound probe has to be able to catch the beams bouncing back from the needle shaft. Things like SonoMB and uh, compound imaging will help, things like beam steer, uh, and it's useful to know what your machine offers when it comes to needle visualization. And here's an example of the leapfrog method. Uh, I think this is well taught by Adrian Gowdy and James Rippey in Western Australia. It's slow but it's safe and it's something that's really good to try with um, the two of you. One person who can see the screen and verbally directs while the other person who's blind to the screen cannulates the phantom, please. Uh, in this way, you practice not only the proprioception and concentrating on not moving the probe, bracing your hand, but you also concentrate on your verbalization and teaching skills because remember, you do have to be able to verbally direct beginners. Let's take a moment to compare the geometry of sliding versus fanning. Sliding is when you keep the probe at 90 degrees to the skin and hopefully to the vessel also. If, however, you use the fan to find technique, you have to beware the geometry of triangles. In your first view, the needle may appear to be further away from the vessel than it actually is. In the second view, 
straight up and down your picture is honest but in the third view you may not see the bevel at all or if you do it's an indistinct flash this is because the angle of your beam is too close to the angle of the needle now let's look at the third trap right left reversal of the probe this is a bit analogous to switching from a Mac to PC in one you'll swipe the page up and in the other one you pull the sidebar down to the place you want to see in the same way the movement of the probe is slightly counterintuitive to beginners it's important to get it right in your head and prepare your setup when you first pick up a probe it's a bit instinctive to think that the things on the screen will move in the same direction as you move the probe in actual fact the opposite happens if you want that vessel to move towards the center of the picture you actually have to push the probe further away from you avoid right left reversal by planning your setup and checking during your scout scan you must make sure to see where the screen watermark is to tap the edge of the probe and remember that uh, contrary to diagnostic scanning you don't automatically put the probe marker to the patient's right in procedural scanning you have to put the screen right to the proceduralist's right which means that if you're standing for example at the head of the bed looking down towards the patient's feet for a central line or an IJ the orientation of the probe the patient and the screen will be a little bit different to what you are used to check it first trap number four is when you think you're in the vessel it looks like you're in the vessel but you're not getting any flashback a common scenario for this one would be when you're trying to cannulate a fairly small and fiddly radial artery. This is a problem that almost always happens in longitudinal. Uh, it took me a while to set this one up, but as you can see here, although the needle looks like it's smack bang in that vessel, in actual fact it's not. So here's a rather shonky example. And it took me several goes to actually manage to miss this vessel, but here it looks like we're in the vessel in long, perhaps not quite in the middle. Then we, when we turn 90 degrees on the vessel, you can see I've just skipped down the outside. The explanation has to do with physics and artifacts and will allow you to wax lyrical and sound important when you drop little words like side lobe. Now when we talk about ultrasound beam, we often refer to it as a credit card of thickness but we don't mention side lobes because they're not usually a problem for us in fact the machine usually damps them out when we're taught about ultrasound we learn about that narrow beam that's generated down the center of the probe but we usually don't pay much attention to the softer side lobes that are created they a bit like petals that unfold from the central beam any sound waves or pulses returning from these side lobes are usually very weak and they're dampened out by the filters within the probe so essentially they're ignored the other thing about this is that the probe itself only admits to the central beam so that any returning signals that do happen to jump in over the filtering bands will be plotted by the machine as within arising from the central beam so imagine the situation where we have the vessel within the central beam but we have a very bright coherent reflector such as a needle shaft in a side lobe it may just happen to send back a signal strong enough to get in over the dampener now the transducer deals with this as it deals with all signals in other words it plots them within the central beam and that's how it's possible to have a picture of a needle within a vessel when it's no such thing this is one explanation, this is one example of side lobe. We also see side lobe when we see gas appearing to be within the gallbladder or gas from the duodenum giving a, a white haze across the middle of a cardiac scan. So ways to avoid this are pretty much repetition of the ways that we've been mentioning for all of our other problems. Brace, 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 wrap the probe lead, align everything up, but also, particularly when you're a beginner, it's really helpful to have somebody else watching the hub of your needle. That way they, you, they can tell you when you get that flush back without you having to take your eyes off the screen.
the proprioception will return, but not for a few months. Don't forget to watch for that little rebound of the wall, the vessel wall as you puncture it. It's particularly important when you have a fairly low volume vessel and it's quite easy to indent the, the leading edge of the vessel wall quite significantly before you actually puncture it. So wait for that bounce back. I find trap number five really hard to explain. I call it parallax error. It's the sort of thing you get when you're trying to do a longitudinal cannulation in a deep vessel that's on the side of something. Most particularly is the, it's the basilic vein, but it can also be um, an IJ on the side of someone's neck. You know this is happening where you've got everything lined up beautifully and you just still can't see the needle on the screen. You're scanning a curved surface and your probe is not perpendicular to the floor. However, when you look at your screen, it appears to be straight up and down, as always. Here's an example, and it's one that I want you to try particularly with the phantoms. There are two ways to approach this problem. Most of us use some uh, tricky mental calculations and approximations within our head. We estimate where the Z plane of the vessel is, and we put our needle in at the angle we think might uh, come in contact with the vessel. And if we don't see the needle tip, we swing it fairly widely until we pick it up within the beam width. Now here's how we normally go about it. We get a good picture of the vessel, we estimate where we should be putting the needle, and we insert the needle in what we hope will be uh, an intercepting course. Now it's a bit scary, as what happened here, when I felt the needle go into the vessel but still couldn't see it on the probe until I swung the probe around. Now, it's really scary to enter a vessel when you haven't seen your needle tip at all. Here's another way to do it. Remember that vessels are round, so you can get a clear picture of a vessel from just about any angle. You don't have to be 90 degrees to your skin. So rather than hold the probe at 90 degrees to your phantom, slide it until you're directly straight up and down to the ground, and yet the vessel is clear. In this way, you can go ahead and insert your needle the same way as you always have, straight down to the bed. Because in this particular case, straight down to the bed is also straight down to the vessel. If you don't believe me, try both ways, cannulating in long with your phantom at an angle, and just see what it's like. Those of you who are experienced at this sort of cannulation probably won't have too much trouble, but beginners, I think, will find the second method a lot easier. And finally, don't forget that what you see on the screen is usually very much magnified compared to what's happening in the patient so that one centimetre distance between you and the pleura on the screen may translate to two millimetres distance in the real life patient. So be very careful, do everything under direct vision. If you can't see your needle tip, do not push it in any further. So in summary, the ways things can go wrong. You may be off centre. You may lose contact with the tip of your needle. You may have the probe reversed. You may have to battle with things like side lobes, the angle of incidence and artifacts. If you're scanning on a slope, you're in for a lot of trouble. And don't forget that what you see on the screen is often a lot bigger than what's happening in reality. And to recap, you minimize your risk of error with meticulous planning and positioning. You always keep contact with the tip of your needle. You check your orientation. You must have some understanding of physics. If possible, avoid slopes, and if you can't avoid them, aim your probe at the floor. And remember, scale.